Industrialization based on machinery, already referred to as a characteristic of our age, is but one aspect of the revolution that is being wrought by technology. Emily Green Balk onset of the Civil War, the United States lagged far behind Great Britain, France, and Germany. In the three to four decades that followed, however, the United States vaulted far into the lead to become a truly global economic power. The gross national product growth at this time exceeded 4%, which led renowned economic historian Robert Higgs to remark that he had never before seen rapid growth continue for so long. These changes were brought about by an abundance of coal, iron, timber, petroleum, large flowing rivers, oil, and labor. More specifically, the recently refined for household use oil, the powerful coal plants, and the abundance of iron for the purpose of creating steel were the main factors for the largest amount of growth. Abundances like these paved the way to find new uses for the products manufactured. For example, when entrepreneurs discovered that you could drill for oil pockets, this led to chemists discovering that it could be used for lubricating oil, grease, paint, wax, varnish, naphtha, and paraffin. With a burgeoning population increase, there was a need for three things, technological improvements, communication, and above all, transportation. What we see is that as technology and transportation improve, so does the efficiency of farming which in reality really finalizes the shift from an agricultural society to an industrial society, therefore allowing human resources to be averted towards activities more necessary in a modern uh, developing nation, such as like mining, inventing, or manufacturing. In the second half of the 19th century, the United States had truly become an empire on rails. Men like Cornelius Vanderbilt, Leland Stanford, and James J. Hill led the drive for new, bigger railroads. In 1865, there were 35,000 miles of railroad, an already significant amount globally, but by 1914, there were 254,037 miles of railroad, a staggering amount unrivaled in the world. About $4.5 billion was needed to build these. Some was supplied by American and European investors. The government supplied the rest. Local governments provided $300 million, state governments $228 million, and the federal government $65 million, in addition to the 170 million acres of land provided between 1850 and 1871. The government, however, saved about $1 billion between 1850 and 1945 in mail-carrying fees and freight shipment. However, there was a problem with the recent railroad growth. Before the Civil War, many conflicting small railroad lines, which adopted different schedules, separate depots, and different gauges, which are the distance between the rails. After the Civil War, the consolidation movement rapidly burst out, which led to the setting of the standard gauge in the late 1860s. These consolidated railroad companies were called trunk lines. The rage for railroads is so great that many will be laid in parts where they will not pay. George Stephenson What we see with these early trunk lines is a concerted effort to gain dominance of the route that brings resources from the Great Lakes to eastern seaports, and this tends to be where we see some of the classic massive power struggles between men like Cornelius Vanderbilt and the owners of the Erie Railroad and eventually between bigger companies break out. There were four trunk lines, namely the Baltimore and Ohio, the Erie Railroad, the New York Central that belonged to Cornelius Vanderbilt, and the newest, the Pennsylvania Railroad. Consolidation took much longer in the South until massive capital injections from Europe promoted the growth. Begun in 1862, but not really started until 1865, the building of the Transcontinental Railroad was set in motion and charted to two companies, the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific Railroad, who was financially backed by Leland Stanford and three others. Both railroads appointed hard-driving managers, General Grenville Dodge for the Union Pacific route of Nebraska to Utah, and Charles Crocker, a dry good merchant, for the Sacramento to Utah route. During the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, an epic race between the railroads took place for government, land, and low-interest 30-year loans that the government funded. Both of the competing railroads hired managers based on their reputation for speed and efficiency. The economic reward was extremely significant and led to larger growth for these types of railroads that would take place in the next 30 years. 
When the railroad was finished in 1869, the Union Pacific had built 1,086 miles of railroad and the Central Pacific 689 on rougher terrain. Their meeting at Promontory Point, Utah, accumulated in wild celebrations and the significant Golden Spike Ceremony. In 1883, however, three more railways extended to the Pacific, including James J. Hill's Great Northern Railway, one of the most efficient lines built across the continent. Eventually, however, there was too much railroad growth and too much competition, so it was necessary for bankers like J. Pierpont Morgan to impose order, which is where the massive railroads were consolidated. The Bessemer process so profoundly refined the way steel was made that it opened up a world of opportunities by the means of industrial application and production. Just from this process, you can see billion-dollar businesses pop up like Carnegie Steel and U.S. Steel Corporation. It not only revolutionized steel, but the size and power of corporations that would set the stage for the massive oil or manufacturing companies. I had an immense advantage over many others dealing with the problem as as much as I had no fixed ideas derived from long established practice to control and bias my mind, and did not suffer from the general belief that whatever is, is right. Henry Bessemer. Such was the thought of the generation of inventors and innovators that significantly improved the standard of living at the time. The railroad significantly aided in pushing back the frontier and settling the West. In 1832, a man named Samuel Morse would significantly improve communication. The railroads broadly expanded the market for the telegraph as they developed and grew. By the early 1880s, there was 400,000 miles of telegraph lines connecting the country and modernizing it through quick, simple information. The needs of the telegraph would never have been so great, however, without the process of blasting air through molten iron to keep it hotter and remove impurities. In 1855, Henry Bessemer solved the problems of manufacturing steel and made it more affordable and industrially practical. Mr. Watson, come here. I want you. Alexander Graham Bell. And indeed he did. Alexander Graham Bell, while conducting experiments to help deafness, created the telephone in 1876 with his assistant, Watson. The invention spread rapidly with 10 million telephones in the United States by 1905. In reality, it was electricity that altered home life, business, and government. In 1879, from his laboratory in Menio Park, New Jersey, Thomas Edison created a durable carbon filament for the incandescent lamp. With J.P. Morgan's financial backing, Edison expanded his DC electrical current to light over two million lights around the country. Eventually, it was George Westinghouse, the inventor of the railroad air brake, that further revolutionized electricity by creating the AC electrical current that could transmit over long distances and could be converted into mechanical power. With all of these inventions and improvements, the United States was propelled onto the world stage to become a truly viable world power.